The traditionalist school, also called the perennialist school, is an incredibly misunderstood school of thought. I don't really blame anyone for this, however, because it is an unorthodox system of belief that encompasses like a wacky cast of characters, notably like Julius Evola, who upon being charged for being a fascist, declared himself a super fascist. And there is Rene Ganon, who had a habit of smoking opium because it helped him meditate. I'm going to get back around to those two very interesting characters, but first we should focus on the basic philosophy of perennialism. The basic position that the traditionalist school asserts is that there is a perennial wisdom called Sophia Perennis, which underpins most or all religions. This perennial wisdom is the same throughout each of these religions, and the traditions that express the wisdom are the like in the school's name because of their uh, perennial wisdom. This wisdom cannot be understood through study or ex- uh, but only through uh, direct intuition uh, from the divine intellect, and that's specific. It also generally holds that those who founded these traditions had a very specific capacity to attain direct gnosis from the divine mind. Some of you may be familiar with the perennial philosophy in general, but not specific elements that are associated with the traditionalist school. If this is the case, it's likely you'll be questioning the difference between the traditionalist school and perennialism in general, or how it even relates to tradition. The main distinction is that the traditionalist school advocates for the following of a specific tradition as a means to achieve understanding of perennial truth. On top of that, they are mostly against modernity and its materialistic sort of attitude towards the current a way that the world works. Now that I've dealt with the basic philosophy, we can start moving into the figures who are associated with the traditionalist school. First off, René Ganon, who is often considered to be the founder of the traditionalist school. He wrote such notable works as Introduction to the Hindu Doctrines, Man and His Becoming According to the Vedanta, and Reign of Quantity and the Sign of the Times. René Ganon was an idealist, meaning that he believed there is a metaphysical spiritual reality that causes and affects what we see in the material world, rather than either the other way around or just having like a monistic view of pure materialism. He believed that there was degeneration happening in modernity that was caused by the uh, in- ignorance of the spiritual aspect of life, such as religion, for example. So knowing this, how can one overcome modernity and increase and embrace tradition? Uh, well, luckily, Ganon describes how to embrace tradition. That being, you got to find an order and be initiated into it. And it has to be a traditional uh, lineage, like says here, this is because there is a lineage of direct transmission back to the person who acquired knowledge of tradition, which provides a direct connection with uh, tradition itself and and the divine. I'll throw that in there as well, and the divine. In terms of specific traditions to follow, there are two types, exoteric and esoteric. The exoteric traditions are the basic doctrine and practice of a religion, whereas the esoteric is a deeper practice typically devoted to acquiring knowledge from the divine. It is important to note that some traditions, there is no functional distinction between the esoteric and the exoteric elements. For example, Tantric Buddhism or Tantric Hinduism. There's not really a a distinction there. In terms of uh, choosing a tradition, esoteric traditions work better for attaining perennial wisdom. Frithof Shuan was another important figure in the early traditionalist school. He adapted the idea of God as the first principle, which is not uncommon for the religious, and especially not uncommon for those who are members of the traditionalist school. His position on Sophia Perennis was more developed than previous ideas. He believed that it possessed uh, like a dual nature of being a factual reality and a means of attaining transcendence. 
Schumann characterizes what he calls pure metaphysics as independent from religion, arising from the form arising before the formation of religion and society, and containing all religious symbolisms. That then society and religion evolve out of. The characteristics of these metaphysics are a combination of several things. They include Advaita Vedanta's belief on Atma, Brahman, Maya, and the Sufi doctrine of the five presences. Shuan believed that any spiritual practice based upon Sophia Perinus has four elements. Doctrine, method, virtue, and beauty. In terms of the method, he believed there were three aspects of spiritual practice. The path, the action, and the path of devotional love. Sorry, the path of action, the path of devotional love, and the path of the divine revelation. The first of these two were exoteric practices, whereas the divine revelation is esoteric. Shuan's ethics seem to be a form of virtue ethics dependent upon the qualities of egolessness, such as veracity, charity, and humility. As for beauty, Shuan saw it as the path to transcendence because, it's tech, because of its unique property of causing the recollection of the essences, as a reference to the world of forms of Plato. Sayed Nasser was a member of the traditionalist school who happened to be a Muslim. Much like many other members of the traditionalist school, I wasn't mentioning it, but the other two members of the traditionalist school were also Muslims. He had a personal, he held personal revelation to be a better means of understanding truth than rationalism or scientific inquiry. He viewed himself as a fusion of the traditional Sufi philosophical understanding and the traditional, uh, the traditionalist schools. Of course, he also holds a preference for esoteric traditions above exoteric traditions and believes that, that all but God is illusory, as is typical of the traditionalists and the Sufis. Apart from all that, he believes in several unique philosophical positions. These include, but are not limited to, the conception of the self as containing different levels gradually increasing in reality as they approach the divine part of the self, that consciousness develops from intellect rather than the other way around, and the disdain for the biological sciences and ev- evolutionary theory. Julius Avola is the last person we're going to be talking about because I know he's who you come here for because I know the type of people who watch these videos. So before we begin, yes, Avola did describe himself as a super fascist was racist and anti-Semitic, and was friends with Benito Mussolini and Hitler. And if that bothers you, I recommend you skip this section. Without out of the way, Julius Afola had a more broad view of tradition than the rest of the traditionalists, where it refers to traditional morality and social order. For example, Avola believed in a traditional caste system like those professed in the Manu Smirti or the Rigsthula, and the belief in traditional gender roles. Evola also believed that different races had different types of souls, and there were a few exceptions to that, where one person of a certain race is born with the soul of a different race, but uh, I'm not going to get into like the characteristics of these souls, because he, mind you, again, was racist, and as such, I won't go into it, because I enjoy having my YouTube channel up. Uh, another important, the only other important aspect of his philosophy, really, or like really important, is magical idealism, which holds that there is nothing but the mind, and that everything else should be realized as completely illusory. So, in conclusion, the traditionalist school is, in fact, a pretty wacky school of thought.